Welcome to PALS. It's Prof. Daniel Moussa Anatomy Lecture Series. In this place, our goal is to make anatomy simple. If you are just joining us or you have not subscribed, we would like you to subscribe now and be part of this amazing anatomy family where we make anatomy simple. This is the part two in our series of lectures on the muscles of the forearm. We have divided this lecture series into four parts. Part 1 and Part 2 are on the muscles of the anterior compartment. Part 3 is on muscles of the posterior compartment. While Part 4 is on the anatomical snuff box and cubital fossa. So sit tight, let's go to class. We'll look at flexor carpi ornaris. This is flexor carpi ornaris. It's actually the most medial of the superficial flexors of the forearm I will start with the origin it has additional points of origin to the common point of origin for all the superficial flexors and these two points are the humeral head and the ulnar head so the humeral head is the one that be coming from the medial epicondyle here which is the common point of origin for all the superficial flexors. Now, the additional point of origin is what we call the ulnar head. And then this origin is from the medial border of the olecranon. Here is the olecranon process. And then it comes from this medial border. So we see the humeral head from the medial epicondyle, the ulnar head from one, the olecranon process, and from the posterior border of the ulna in the area I'm running my light. These two points will form its origin and then the muscle will run down to the wrist. Here we see, are seeing the points of attachment of this muscle. Now the tendon will run distally to get attached to one, the pisiform. Here is the pisiform bone. Now from the pisiform bone, it will also extend to attach to the next carpal bone, which is the hamate. So the pisiform and hamate bones are the one or the are two of the eight bones of the wrist, and then they are the two bones that are found on the medial side. From the hamate, it will extend to the base of the fifth metacarpal. So that's why you hear the insertion as the pisiform from pisiform via the pisohamate ligament. From pisohamate ligament, we run to piso metacarpal ligament. So that's the range of insertion of the flexor carpi ulnaris. Let us look at the nerve supply of this muscle. This muscle is supplied by ulnar nerve, and the action is one flexion and then two adduction of the wrist. Now here we are looking, we are seeing flexion of the wrist. And then here we're also seeing the ulnar adduction, ulnar adduction of the wrist. Now, the flexor carpi ulnaris is the next muscle that will have a nerve passing between its two heads. This time it is the ulnar nerve. The last we mentioned was the median nerve passing between the two heads of pronator teres. So we're now seeing the ulnar nerve passing between the two heads of flexor carpi ulnaris. We'll be looking at the biggest muscle of these five superficial flexors and the muscle we've always noted to be a little bit on the deeper plane compared to the rest of the five superficial flexors. And that is flexor deuterium superficialis. It is the largest in this group. It forms the intermediate layer and it has a large range of origin. It originates both from the humerus, from the ulna, and then from the radius. So we can categorize its origin as having a humeral ulna head and then a radial head. Let us look at these heads. So here is the muscle, here is the muscle, this is the muscle. So let's go to its origin. Now we start with the humeral ulna head. In the humeral ulna head, we we'll first consider the common point of origin, which is from the medial epicondyle. We've already showed that. 
Now, it also attached to some of the ligaments around the elbow joint. And one of them is the medial ligament of the elbow. Now, let's look at this picture. Here, we are seeing its origin from the medial epicondyle. Now, the next origin here is from the medial ligament of the elbow joint. Next to that, we will see its origin from the ulna. Now, we have this tubercle at the medial side of the coronoid process of the ulna. And the name of that tubercle is the sublime tubercle. Now, this muscle in the past used to be called the flexor digitorum sublimis as a result of its origin from this sublime tubercle. Now, in this diagram, here is the coronoid process and that's the oligronoid process. Now, in this medial part of the coronoid process, we are seeing the tubercle here, which is a sublime tubercle. So, back to the rest of the origins of the flexor term superficialis. So, here we see the radial head this time. And then the radial head is from the part of radius that is called the anterior oblique line of the radius. So, in this diagram, we are seeing where I'm running my light is the a bony ridge on the radius that is called the anterior oblique line of the radius. So that is it here. So again, let's go through it again. We have this point of origin from the humor ulnar head. We have the origin from the medial epicondyle. We have the origin from the medial ligament of the elbow joint. We have the origin from the sublime tubercle. This will all form the humor ulnar head. And then we now move to radius. And then in radius, we look at the anterior oblique line of the radius. This flexor determinum superficialis, as it runs distally, will break out into four tendons. These four tendons will be the tendons that will be flexing the medial four fingers in the hand. Now, these tendons are tendons with the second, third, fourth, and fifth fingers. At the level of the flexor retinaculum, that is within the carpal tunnel, these four tendons will not lie side by side. The tendons that will be running to the third and fourth fingers will lie superior to the tendons that will be running to the second and fifth fingers. So we have this illustration here. Now this is a common sheet that is wrapping both the tendons of the flexor tulum flexualis above and then the tendons of the flexor tulum profundus below. Where I'm running my light now is showing the tendons of the flexor tulum profundus lying side by side. But unlike that for flexor tulum profundus, see the tendons to the third where my light is here and the fourth fingers lying above the tendons to the second and fifth fingers. As soon as they go beyond the flexor retinal column, these tendons will also move to stay side by side and run on the same plane as I guess what we have noted at this point. In the insertion of this muscle, the, these four tendons will move and will get inserted in the middle phalanges of the media four fingers. Let us look at our diagrams and see how it runs. So here, here we are seeing the proximal phalanges, we are seeing the middle phalanges and then we are seeing the distal phalanges. So actually these muscles in this medial four, four fingers will be inserting at, the, at this point of the middle phalanges. Now in this illustration we are seeing the two tendons of flexor tulum superficialis and flexor tulum profundus running towards the finger. This is the tendon for flexor tulum superficialis for one finger and then deep to it we are seeing that for flexor deuterum profundus. So both of them will actually be supplying the fingers but there are some few differences. Now let's identify those differences. We see at the middle of the proximal phalanx the tendon of the flexor tulum superficialis will split into two. 
giving a space for tendon of flexor deteriorating profundus to emerge and will continue to the distal phalanx, while the split tendons of flexor deteriorating socialis will end on each side of the middle phalanx. As you can notice here, this is for profundus coming from below and then passing between flexor deteriorating superficialis, and then here we are seeing the the split ends of flexor deuterium superficialis. So here we're seeing insertion of profundus at the distal phalanx and then insertion of the superficialis at the middle phalanx. Innervation is by median nerve. Let's look at the various actions. These tendons, as they run through the various joints, will be flexing every joint they are able to move across. That is why flexor deuterium superficialis will be able to flex the wrist joint metacarpophalangeal joint this is the metacarpophalangeal joint this is the proximal ip joint and then here we have the distal ip joint so because this tendon past the wrist joint it will be able to flex the hand at the level of the wrist because it passed the metacarpophalangeal joint it will be able to flex the fingers at this joint and because the tendon also pass the proximal interphalangeal joint, flexor deuterium superficialis will be able to flex this joint. But if you remember, the tendons ended at the middle phalanx, so they did not pass the distal interphalangeal joint. So it means that flexor deuterium superficialis can only flex this proximal interphalangeal joint, but will be, will be unable to flex the distal interphalangeal joint because it stopped before crossing this joint. Now look at the deep muscles. For the deep muscles, we start with flexor deuterium profundus. Flexor deuterium profundus is the muscle we are seeing here. One thing that is outstanding about the muscle is that it is the most powerful and the bulkiest of all the muscles of the forearm, including the muscles in the anterior compartment and the muscles in the posterior compartment. We we'll consider the origin of this muscle. This muscle peaks origin from the upper three quarter of the anterior surface of the shaft of the ulna. It will also peak origin from the adjoining part of the interstitial membrane. This is the ulna and here is the radius. So this muscle will peak origin from this upper three quarter of ulna and then part of the interosseous membrane. In its insertion, we noted that it inserted at the proximal phalanx. The nerve supply is actually from both the ulnar nerve and from a branch of the median nerve. And that branch of the median nerve is called the anterior interosseous nerve. So this muscle, because it gains innervation from two different nerves, it is called a composite muscle or a hybrid muscle. Its lateral half is from the anterior interosseous nerve, which is a branch of the median nerve as I noted, and then the medial half is from the ulna. Just like in flexor deuterium superficialis, all the joints it passed, it will flex, and then it will start from flexion of the wrist, flexion at the metacarpophalangeal, flexion at the proximal IP joint, and flexion at the distal IP joint. So flexor deuterium profundus is the only muscle that will flex the distal interphalangeal joint of the medial four fingers of the hand. Now we'll look at pronator quadratus. This is pronator quadratus here. It is seen picking origin from the anterior surface of the distal part of the ulna. Now, here is the distal part of the ulna, and this is the part of the ulna bone that it picks origin from. Its insertion is also within the same area, distal 1 over 4 of the anterior surface of the radius. The nerve supply is anterior interosseous nerve, and the action is actually pronation. It is the prime mover of the action of pronation. It also helps to hold the bones together.
that is the two bones, the radius and the ulna. It would be nice to look at this function of the pronator teres and pronator quadratus. The action of supination and pronation is seen happening at two joints. The joints are the proximal the ulna joint, where we have the head of radius rotating at the radial notch of the ulna. And then the next part is the distal radial ulnar joint. Here we see the head of ulna rotating on the ulnar notch of the radius. So this movement is pronation. So what muscles bring about pronation and its opposite movement, supination? Now the muscles that produce supination are two and they are biceps brachii and the supinator. The ones that produce pronation, they are also two. They are pronator teres and pronator quadratus. We also have the brachioradialis actually assisting in this action of pronation and can only put the forearm in a mid prone position at half pronation level. Now here we we'll see the lower part of the biceps brachii going to eat in session in the radial tuberosity. We also here see the supinator, which is one of the muscles that we are mentioning in the postural compartment. And then here we are seeing the pronator quadratus. And then here we are seeing the pronator teres. So we have the two pronators, the pronator teres and pronator quadratus. So we have the two muscles between supination, the supinator muscle here, and the biceps breaker here. So for pronation, we see contraction of both the pronator quadratus and the pronator teres. While for supination, we see the contraction of the supinator and also the lower part of the biceps brachii muscle. Before we close the class on this section, we look at flexor pollicis longus. Flexor pollicis longus is the muscle we are seeing here. This is flexor pollicis longus, where my light is running. The origin is from the anterior surface of the middle of the shaft of radius and also adjoining part of the interosseous membrane. It gets inserted into the palmar surface of the base of the distal phalanx of the thumb. Now the flexor pollicis longus is doing a similar work that is done by flexor digitorum profundus. This is a tendon of the flexor pollicis longus and we see it running to the base of the distal phalanx of the thumb. Its nerve supply is from the untrained treacherous nerve which is said is a branch of median nerve and then the action here is flexion of the thumb. This is where we end this part of the lecture. If you have questions, comments or suggestions, please drop them in the comment section. The part 3 of this lecture will be on muscles of posterior compartment of the forearm. If you consider this material helpful, we will encourage you to subscribe, like the video and share it to your friends that it will also be helpful too. And together, we will build a unique anatomy family where we make anatomy simple. See you in my next video and bye for now.